Welcome to Gospel in Life. Thank you for joining as we go through this special series of meditations by Tim Keller, Trusting God in Difficult Times. This new series is meant to encourage you to trust God more deeply and to meditate on His Word and what it promises to give you strength and hope in difficult times. And now here's today's meditation. Let me read from Psalm 46, verses 1 to 4, and then two other verses. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The Lord is with us, and he says, be still and know that I am God. Now, this is a very, very famous psalm, of course, and it's also a great psalm for times of anxiety and fear. Uh, And it's more eloquent than maybe any other psalm when it talks about, uh, we will not fear though the earth be removed and the mountains fall into the midst of the sea. It's interesting that uh, when Psalm 46 was written, uh, it was normal to besiege cities, and sometimes you actually could uh, sack a city. You could get through the walls and you could defeat it, Uh, they surely thought it was exaggerating to say that the mountains uh, could fall in the midst of the sea. But today we do have bombs that could do that. Uh, We we actually are facing things like that. It's possible. Human beings are able to do that. So what it's talking about are earthly cities which can be besieged. They can be bombed. uh, They can be destroyed. And it's contrasting that with the heavenly city, the city of God. When it says... There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. It's telling us this. When an earthly city had a river running through it, it actually made it harder to besiege it. If it actually had a supply of water and maybe even fish and things like that, it was more difficult uh, for the the invading army to uh, bring it down. But what this is saying is the heavenly city has a river. It's the spirit of God. It's uh, It's the power of God. That means while any earthly city can be destroyed, the heavenly city cannot be destroyed. Now, what, what, what difference does that make? Every Christian is a citizen of some earthly city. I'm a citizen of New York City. But every Christian's real citizenship is in the heavenly city. So you have places like Philippians 3, verse 20, that says our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, That's our true and most foundational citizenship. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 20 says, our names are written in heaven. You see, if if you're not a uh, a natural born citizen to the United States and you come here and you want to be a citizen, you have to learn things, you have to take classes, there's things you have to do. Uh, You have to stay out of trouble, of course. Uh, uh, You can't be in, you can't do crime. And therefore, you have to, in a sense, earn your citizenship. But we're told that our names are already written in heaven by the grace of God. They're already inscribed there. So what this is telling us is the benefits of earthly citizenship can be taken away from you. There's all sorts of things that can do it. Uh, What are the benefits of earthly citizenship? Well, I can vote, choose my leaders. I can, um, uh, I have rights, I have rights in court. I have rights to uh, public schools. I have rights to medical care. I have all sorts of rights. But of course, if there's, a, there's all sorts of things that can take those rights away. A plague, uh, a war. There's all kinds of things that can sweep away the benefits of my earthly citizenship, but nothing can take away my, uh, the benefits of my heavenly citizenship. citizenship. Nothing at all. What are those benefits? Jonathan Edwards wrote a sermon when he was just 18 years old. It's the first sermon we know he ever preached, certainly the first sermon we ever had. And it's on Christian happiness. And his basic three points of his sermons are this. The basic three points were this. If you're a Christian, your bad things will turn out for good. Your good things can never be taken away from you. And the best things are yet to come. Bad things will turn out for good, Romans 8, 28. If you're a Christian, then all things work together for good to those who called, are called uh, according to God's uh, purpose and who are loved by God. Secondly, your good things cannot be taken away from you. What are those good things? You're justified by faith. Uh, you're adopted and you're now a child of God. He's not just your boss or your king, he's your father. 
You have the Holy Spirit in you. Uh, these things can never be taken away. And the best things are yet to come. The worst thing that can happen to a Christian is that you die. And then, of course, all that does is actually put you into the Father's arms, puts you right before the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. And so, Jonathan Edwards said, if you know all these things, you don't have to be afraid. Let me just read you a fascinating quote by, from, a, uh, from Jonathan Edwards' sermon. He's only 18 years old, and this is what he said. How joyful and gladsome must the thoughts of Jesus Christ be to a Christian. To think how great a love Christ has for us, even to lay down his life and suffer the most bitter torments for our sake. Who also now continually intercedes for us at the throne of grace. To consider that so great a person as the eternal Son of God, who also made the worlds, is not ashamed to call us brethren. Who will come in and sup with us and us with him. And we will see his arms expanded to embrace us, and we will see him offering himself to be embraced by us. Therefore, you may now look down upon the whole army of worldly afflictions and suffering, and you can consider with joy that however great they are and however numerous, even though they might join all their forces together against you and put on their most rueful and dreadful habits, forms, and appearances, and spend all their strength, vigor, and violence against you, they cannot do you any real hurt or mischief, and it will all be in vain. You may triumph over them all if you know these things. And now here's Tim and Kathy Keller for a short time of Q&A on today's meditation. Um, when you were reading the scripture, the verse that really jumped out at me was, Be still and know that I am God. And the women in my um, Bible study that I was talking to, we had a Zoom Bible study on Thursday. One of the, the topics that kept getting kicked around was how can we utilize this time of uh, quarantine and lockdown, et cetera, so that we come out on the other side stronger, better, wiser, smarter. So do you have any ideas on, you know, here we are in a period of enforced stillness. Who would have ever thought that you could do such a thing in New York City as the city that never sleeps is now, you know, forced to be still? It's the whole thing, the, the lockdown, all of the whole thing, is going to be just wasted if we come out on the other side, having not changed a bit spiritually, grown, grown as in our relationships right. personally. Just give me some, I mean, this has well, come up in my ladies' Bible study, but I'm sure it's come up in the minds of a lot of other people, is what do we do with this time so that we yeah. come out on the other side stronger, better, wiser? I think that's a very wise thing to pick up on, being still. There, there's been plenty of things read, uh, written about the fact that we are the least contemplative culture in history. People have no time. I mean, I read from Jonathan Edwards, and I do know that Edwards uh, spent a lot of time riding on his horse from place to place. It would take him an hour to get uh, to, uh, you know, to, to go see a, a parishioner. And on the way, he would think and pray. And actually, one of the, one of the uh, funny things is that what, the, what he would do is when he would get an idea, he would take notes, and he would pin them to his coat <laughs> because that was the only thing he could do. And so sometimes he would arrive at a parishioner's place with, with a little... Uh, uh, little I'm amazed he could read He looked them. like a pin cushion. But that's because he had time to think. And we do not. And I do think that what we have to do is we have to cultivate contemplative habits. It does mean praying more, but I mean really learning how to pray. It does mean maybe praying morning and evening. It does mean reading the Psalms. It does mean uh, perhaps, uh, I, don't, I hate to call it journaling. I, as When I'm reading the Bible, I find because of my temperament or maybe it's my, uh, the way in which I learn things, if I write down my thoughts, I remember them better and they become more clear. It's not really journaling, it's not really a diary, it's just writing out what I'm reading. And very often it's, it's, it's easier for me to meditate on it and pray it back to God if I've written it down. So I don't know what your contemplative habits are gonna be, but we are, uh, we are the least contemplative, busiest, most mobile, running around, 
group of people I know. And the big danger is we're still on our cell phones at home. Yeah. And if you just and allow... Zoom, as it, our Zoom calls. And the Zoom calls. Our, so you yeah. could be just as dominated. You really do need solitude. You do need to get you know into your prayer closet. And this is the time to do it because we don't have the commutes. We actually can make time for that right now. And I do think, therefore, being still in order to meet God would be a wonderful slogan for this time. It might fall on deaf ears if you're talking to parents who are trying to work at home and True. they've got a couple of kids underfoot. They go to bed, though. Well, they do go to bed, and there's such a thing as trading off morning and evening, yep. that sort of thing. So, okay, well, that's good advice. I, mean, I read a book. I didn't read a book. I read the title of a book years ago called Don't Waste Your Sorrows Right. Uh, by Paul Bilhammer, I think yeah, his name was. And, and never, never read the book, never read the content because the title was so challenging. I didn't feel, I felt like I didn't really need to In some to ways, it's book. a good book, but actually the title, the title tells you the book. The title says it all, yeah. right. So here we are in a time of sorrow and confusion and and everything's don't waste your upside shutdown. down. Yeah, don't waste your shutdown. Don't waste your confinement. Don't waste your quarantine. Um, get something out of it. Don't just grit your teeth and say, well, it's going to be over. But find ways to use what you've been given. Agreed. If you found today's meditation encouraging, please subscribe below and be sure to share it with a friend to encourage them as well. And if you'd like to hear more teachings by Tim Keller, you can listen to new sermons every week at gospelandlife.com slash podcast. Thanks again for watching Gospel and Life.